Hello and welcome to the Weekly Stuff Podcast with Jonathan Lack and Sean Chapman. We are here to talk about stuff this week on the show. We are going to be giving you some first impressions of God of War Ragnarok, the brand new uh, game for PS4, PS5, sequel to 2018's God of War, and uh, it's pretty good so far. Yes, I, I, I really liked God of War 2 back in the day, and I'm liking God of War 2 too. Once again, we are back <laughs> in the world of the twos. Um, yeah, it's great. At least this one you can search for online, and you can yes. find it because it has a subtitle. Biggest failing of the 2018 game, hard to search for online. Yes, this is not a Modern Warfare 2 situation. Uh, they they yes. avoided that problem uh, deftly. Indeed. So that'll be our main topic today. Have another couple of odds and ends. We will not be talking about Black Panther Wakanda Forever because Sean has not seen it. No, I've not seen it yet. It's also terrible, and I'm sad, and... You can go read my Twitter for my thoughts on it. I didn't like it. I just want to tap out of Marvel forever at this point. Uh, it's just all depressing to me. Well, that makes me excited to go see the movie. It's uh, I was going to say it's a movie. I'm not sure it is a movie. It's a Disney Plus show edited into a movie shape, kind of. It's, it's not really a movie. Mm -hmm. Anyway, uh, yeah, not talking about that today. Talking about some other stuff. Quick piece of housekeeping I want to give is... Um, Sean, I don't know. Have you noticed Twitter's been uh, getting some problems lately? Yeah, uh-huh. No, I've noticed the most, like, comical thing that has happened in the history of social media, which is Elon Musk fucking Twitter into the ground, basically, with his remarkable incompetence. It's extremely funny. Like, I'm enjoying it a lot. People are, like, leaving Twitter. That's stupid. Watch, stay and watch Rome burn. It's funny. Um, you know, we've got fucking... People imitating giant pharmaceutical conglomerates and causing them to lose half a trillion in market value. That's awesome. That's fucking hilarious. Not Elon Musk's intent. Almost surely makes it impossible for him to ever make money on this thing because advertisers mm -hmm. are never going to want to be on that platform. And <laughs> that's hilarious. Uh, it does, downside of all that means, I don't know if we're going to have a choice about whether or not to be leaving Twitter in the near future because I think it's just going to die. It seems like the most likely option here, Occam's Razor, if you're driving something into the ground, typically you can't take it back off again. That's the whole flight metaphor, right? You're flying it into the ground. The plane doesn't get up again. So I am trying to think about ways we can sort of stay connected to the podcast audience with Twitter really being the only social media either of us use heavily. Um... And so my initial thing is I did set up a Substack newsletter a couple years ago that I was experimenting with during the pandemic. Uh, actually, this is kind of funny. It was before the pandemic, and I think the pandemic kind of threw me off, and I didn't use it much more. But I still have it, and it's just – you can go to it right now. It's weeklystuff.substack.com. It's very easy to find. I called it the Weekly Stuff WordCast, uh, and I put some stuff up there. I'm going to start using it again. I'm going to start, like – getting podcast updates so when the podcast comes out on monday i'll send out a newsletter with it and it'll have the like youtube video embedded and stuff like that so if you used if you followed me or sean on twitter just to kind of like know when the podcast is coming out probably a safe bet to just subscribe to that um some people charge for Substacks. i don't this is free and this will always be free um there, i have no plans to ever monetize this it's just a simple update and then other stuff can go out there too like i had an article over the weekend that i was about to talk talk about uh but that's on there and sean i gave you access to it so if sean mm -hmm. ever wants to post like hatsune miku pictures or something you can use the Substack for that sure eventually yeah i'll just i'll i'll find something ridiculous to put up there yeah so again not like i, I don't know if that's a long-term solution but it's like an easy place to like just in case we wake up tomorrow and elon has just decided to shut the whole thing down because people are making fun of him too much and he has the thinnest skin in the entire fucking world or Twitter um, just, like, breaks because, right. like, everybody, all the engineers and everybody working there are leaving because they're yes. not idiots and they see that the ship is sinking and then eventually there's nobody to maintain the technical platform and the technical platform just breaks uh, uh -huh. and then it, it can't be fixed. I Indeed, like, which I, is what I think is going to happen. That is my prediction. That's if I was betting, I think the first thing that's going to happen is that Twitter will physically break as a piece of programming. I think it makes sense. I've seen signs of that in my own usage of it. I don't know about you, Sean, but like I've been getting spam DMs every single day since Elon bought this thing, and I didn't used to get that. And for a couple days, I, I was sending reports, and then I realized 
those reports aren't going to anyone. Uh-huh. That team is gone. So I stopped sending the reports. Um, but it's meant that I've had to like ignore my DMs. Um, it's been crazy. So anyway, that's one step. I'm thinking about other things we could do to kind of like keep engaged with the audience that's maybe a little more centralized. Um, and we'll see. I think for now, this is probably good. Uh, I like, there's no way to translate what we do to like TikTok or anything. Uh-huh. And frankly, I'm too old to figure that out. I do have a TikTok just to go watch things sometimes, but mostly it is very alien to me. Uh, so we'll see. But for now, weeklystuff.substack.com. If you just want to keep updated on all things podcast, if there's going to be an off week, if there's going to be, I want to tell you guys what the schedule is going to be, I will put updates there uh, and it should be good. Cool. Sounds good. Yeah. So, and uh, we'll continue to revel in the burning of Twitter. Uh, yes, it, yeah, it is fun to be in inside the the virtual room as it is burning down, and Elon Musk is fiddling away. Is basically what it feels like. I truly, I truly don't think there's ever been such a stark example of the genuine pathology that happens to rich people than having forty four billion dollars to burn, and instead of spending that solving world hunger, solving homelessness contributing to anti-climate change efforts, anything that would get your name in the history books for very good reasons, you know? Even even like on the level of like the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, right? Mm-hmm. Something like that. Instead of doing any of that, you use it to buy a pretty shitty social media platform, make it shittier, and probably ruin it. Um, rich people have brain worms, and I hope I'm never that rich because I want to have my humanity. Yeah, I mean, it's just a lot of people like Elon Musk suffer under the delusion that they are successful in a financial sense because of their own competence and their own ability. When that is not the case, they have inherited their wealth. Um, And so they think, oh, well, I can make Twitter better if I own Twitter because I have lots of money. And therefore, that means that I am like I am a genius man. Um, And Elon Musk is a complete fucking moron. It's a thing we have all known for years and years and years. And this is the most, like, clear example of that. Like, it is the most clear thing I think we've seen, like, our lifetimes maybe, of someone who is rich because they have inherited their wealth, like, ponying about their, like, incredible incompetence to the whole world um, because they're doing something that is so publicly dumb. And you have such, like, clear access to every single decision that is made along the way that is incredibly fucking stupid, starting with the amazingly dumb idea of charging people $8 to get their verification and turning <laughs> verification into like a subscription thing, which yes. was like the first thing that happened. And as soon as you saw that, you're like, oh, it's too late. Like if this is the person, if the person running Twitter thinks that it is a good idea to take the thing that exists so that people can know this is an authentic person or brand or representative of some organization and that's why that check mark exists is so that you know it's not a fake account like you know basically parading in like stolen identity taking that and making that a thing you can have be pay eight dollars eight dollars it's like <laughs> less money than you pay for a fucking lunch um and and that's what you're doing that was you know the stupidest thing i think i've ever seen someone do like it is it was so phenomenally stupid and that is you know, that was just like the first thing that happened. It's it's the closest I think we will ever come to seeing the emperor has no clothes in real life. Yes. Because you've had all these fucking tech reporters for years. People who are otherwise, I think, very like smart and good at their jobs. Sl- it's just like salivating over Elon and his success and all this stuff. That he must be a genius because blah, blah, blah. And it just being proven definitively wrong in real time. And like... What I what I just want to like shake these people who have been like saying like well he is really smart but what's going on on Twitter is different you know like those people I want to shake them and be like you know he didn't build the Teslas right yeah. you know he didn't build the rockets at SpaceX there are a lot of really smart talented people working at those companies I don't think he's one of them having the money to make other people build stuff for you which you then make money off of like that's not a skill really. Like, I've never seen anyone be... And this is true for so many of the current generation of Silicon Valley people. Him and Zuckerberg and all these people. Where, like, no one can point me 
in their reporting to like, what is the thing this person actually did to make this thing successful? Like not the product itself, but this person, what was their contribution? You know, if you go back in time, Steve Jobs didn't build the Apple II, he didn't build the iPhone, but you can very clearly point to what he did to make Apple successful. That's not hard to figure out, right? Mm -hmm. But like, then you've got this new generation of fucking idiots who are driving everything into the ground and people just think, well, the thing is successful, so they must be smart. And it's completely detached from reality because the actual like successful CEOs and business people you don't hear about because they're not out there fucking tweeting and pimping their own like personal brand, right? Like, I'll just use the Apple example again. Tim Cook isn't going around subtweeting people who are mad about Apple products, right? Yeah, he's he's he <laughs> has better shit to do with his life, right? You know? More he's power. He's doing to, the know. job. Yeah, like a successful like... CEOs don't. And there's other problems with like the entire business structure, but actual successful business people don't have the time to be getting into Twitter fights. It's ridiculous. Yeah. Um, Sorry. But th that's not nearly as entertaining as seeing this no, man child self destruct uh, on, on Twitter for us all. It's great. It's great. All right. Uh, what else is going on in the world, Sean? Uh, can I talk quickly about this thing I, I published over the weekend? Um, yeah, that I thought was fun. So uh, I don't know if you guys have heard of this before, but uh, there is a poll that comes out every 10 years in the British film journal Sight and Sound. And it is they poll like critics and academics from around the world, uh, mainly the English kind of Eurocentric world, um, although broadening over time to determine what are the 100 best films of all time. Usually just the top 10 is kind of what you see reported, but they do rank it out to 100. And this is the poll where like Citizen Kane forged its reputation as the greatest film of all time, for mm -hmm. instance. It had it was number one for decades in that poll. Uh, and then in the 2012 version, it was dethroned by Vertigo, which is a decidedly lesser movie than Citizen yeah. Kane. I thought it was fucking ridiculous. But anyway, um, that was the 2012 edition. The 2022 edition should be coming like any day now. It's the December issue of the magazine. So we'll probably know late in November what the results are. And it's always just kind of exciting to see like, this is like the most sort of prestigious and wide ranging poll. And what does the sort of like film collective brain out there decide is the greatest now? And it's kind of funny to, to, to follow. But I'd kind of always wanted to try this exercise because I've made lists of my favorite movies before. But I'm always very careful to like do the favorite thing because I do mm -hmm. think that's different than saying the greatest. Um you know, and, and my area of, and I think you can't do the greatest without some like expertise in the field. Right. Yeah. Um, like I would not try to rank the greatest Victorian novels because I don't know a lot about Victorian novels. I tell you ones I've read that I like, but that's a different thing. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I feel like, you know, I'm 30 years old. I am close to finishing my PhD in film studies. I feel like I, I could probably take a crack at this and feel like what, let me plant my flag and say, what are the 10 greatest films of all time from my critical perspective? Obviously, personal taste still plays into it and all that, and personal experience. I have quite a few Japanese movies on my list because that is what I study, and I actually think that's a good balancing because you'll notice the sight and sound list is extraordinarily Eurocentric every time because that's what most people who speak English sort of study. Um, but anyway, so I finally took a crack at it, and I did a top 100. I'm not going to go through the whole top 100 here, although that could be a fun episode at some point. But I did just want to quickly run through the top 10, uh, because I thought it would be fun. Because again, I've never tried it this way of saying like, okay, this isn't what are my favorite movies. These are, I think these are the best I've ever seen in a rank of 10. Which means sometimes, and I also set myself a rule, one per director. That's not the rule on the sight and sound list, but for me, like... I just, I just thought it would ensure variety and like fight mm -hmm. against sort of, I love Hayao Miyazaki. If I'm being honest, I would probably just put all of his movies on the list, but then that would kind of defeat the purpose of the list, right? Yes. Yeah. So do you want me to run through this really quick here, Sean? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. So at number 10, I had Satyajit Ray's film, Pather Panchali, uh, Song of the Little Road is how it's usually translated. And that is the first film of his Apu trilogy. Um landmark work of Indian cinema, of parallel cinema, of sort of the post-Italian neo-realist sort of move uh, in various national cinemas towards sort of a realist aesthetic to kind of uh, show the nature of different countries and places and lifestyles around the world, and just one of the most beautiful human portraits in film history. Such a gorgeous movie. Ray was a painter 
before he was a director, same as kind of like Akira Kurosawa, and so had a very painterly eye on the world. His storyboards for Pather Panchali are gorgeous, because this movie had like no budget, no resources, um, made over a number of years because they kept like losing funding, but you had someone who had just such a vision that it came out kind of perfect. And it's just one of those movies I sit down and I watch and I go, yeah, this is one of the greatest movies ever made. Just like intellectually in my head, like I know that. And so mm-hmm. there it goes on the list. Cool. Yeah. My number nine is The New World by Terrence Malick. You all know I love Terrence Malick. When I do my favorites lists, I often, what I usually have for him is The Tree of Life. And I do love The Tree of Life and I do think it's a masterpiece. I do think looking at his filmography, I think his best film is either Days of Heaven or the New World, I lean towards the New World, which I think is just you. It's it's a ma- more mature work in the sense of his style, but also I think just it's it's the one that hits me of like this is a every time I go back to it, such a big fucking slice of movie, the kind of thing that you would put on a list of best movies ever made. It is a you know envisioning of sort of the Pocahontas story, um, but not in the Disney fight. <laughs> way uh in a much more interesting way a really interesting vision almost like a dream version of sort of the founding of america and also the the nightmare side of that dream with one of the most remarkable performances of all time in Corianka kilcher who was n- new to acting at the time playing pocahontas um and just it, this is a movie that has three different cuts it's so funny malik made a like 150 minute cut put that in theaters Decided he didn't like it, pulled it out of theaters, put back in theaters a 130 minute cut, and then a few years later on DVD did a three hour cut. The three hour cut is the best one. I think his instincts were sort of wrong initially to try to trim it down. I think it breathes better at length. So, but any version you find uh, is still, I think, one of the 10 greatest movies ever made. Also, Colin Farrell, who I like that we have all come back around on Colin Farrell. There was Mm -hmm. a period where it was unpopular to say he was a good actor, and I think we've now realized. He's a fun dude. He's a good actor. Apparently, he can fucking party like no one else on set. Um, and uh, I love him. And, you know, he also will get under 50 pounds of prosthetics to play the penguin in the Batman. It's great. Yes, yes. Yeah. No, he, I, I agree. He's one of those actors. Everyone's probably have an actor that has a weird arc to their career. Um, and we are on, like, an upswing very much for Colin Farrell. Of all the, like... Because Malik often has sort of big movie stars in his work. And I think of all the big movie stars... His turn in this might be my favorite. Uh, his style is just so perfect for what Malik is going for, and I really love what he does here. For my number eight, I had Orson Welles' The Magnificent Ambersons. I am one of those iconoclasts who will say the the full Welles masterwork is The Magnificent Ambersons, not Citizen Kane. There are other ones you could make the argument for, like Chimes at Midnight, obviously. Mm-hmm. Um, I go Magn- I, you know, Magnificent Ambersons, if you don't know, famously is a movie that was very heavily truncated by the studio. Wells's cut was over two hours. The cut that survives is under 90 minutes. A lot of it was cut out. The studio, while Wells was down in Mexico, came in and shot a like 90 second epilogue that is tacked on to the end of the movie because the movie has a very bleak ending and then it has this just completely discordant 90 second epilogue that's crazy uh, and does not work. And yet, despite those sort of you know injuries done to the movie it is still just so clearly in its body one of the all-time masterpieces the invention of citizen kane kind of dialed up to 11 and i think with this literary basis uh in the book that wells is working from uh, wells himself is not in the movie but he narrates and i think it's the greatest use of narration in movie history uh it's just it's a stunning movie the the cinematography and the level of invention that is going on there is a big centerpiece ball scene that is just one of the best constructed pieces of film of all time. And so I am I am on Team Magnificent Ambersons. And I think if we ever, somehow, somewhere in the world, a print survives of Wells' actual cut, which is possible, crazier things have happened. Um, I think that's prob- that probably is a candidate for like the number one spot on like the global list because it would mm-hmm. be that good. But what we have is enough for me for number eight. I, I I can't agree with you on the Ambersons team. I mean, I think it's an amazing movie, um, okay. but I, I would be on Citizen Kane, or if I wanted to be Iconic Classic, I would go Chimes at Midnight. Those would be the two I would pick personally, but... Yeah. I mean, it's fine. I, 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 yeah, they're, they're, it's, they're all good choices with Orson Welles. This is the one for me. Uh, but yeah, chi- I mean, Chimes at Midnight I thought about, because that one mm-hmm. is also, you know, holy crap. 
but yeah. you could go with all. You, you can't go wrong with Orson Welles. Fuck, you but. could go if you wanted, really wanted to go for it. You could go for uh, F for Fake. Um, that would yes, be a fun yes, you pick. Could. I've seen people doing that. It's actually one of the funnest parts is that I feel like most people who do a sight and sound list have a Wells on there, and I like seeing the non-citizen Kane choices because I think it tells you something about a person. Mm-hmm. Um, and F for yeah, I would if I saw a list that had F for Fake, I'd go fuck yeah, that's great. That's an awesome yes, choice. Yes. Yeah, totally. Uh, my number seven is A Touch of Zen by King Hu, mm-hmm. one of my favorite directors, Taiwanese uh, uh, wuxia filmmaker, and A Touch of Zen, which is his three-hour epic, uh, one of his three-hour epics. He has multiples. Um, a Touch of Zen was originally released as two films. The version that survives is combined into one edit. Um, and just, I don't even know how to describe this movie, except that you have to see it. And it is a martial arts film and a Buddhist parable and one of the great masterpieces of mise-en-scene and editing in film history. Uh, it's, it's that good. And King Hu is another director where if I wanted to, I could pick Dragon Inn, or I could pick Raining in the Mountain, or Legend of the Mountain, uh, or his other... It's just, he's, he's one of the best filmmakers of all time. This is mine, but you could pick other ones too. Yeah, it's a hell of a movie. Yeah. My number six is Spirited Away by Hayao Miyazaki. You might have heard me talk about it before. I like this movie. Uh, I also do just, you know, I had to have a, an animated movie on here. I had to have an anime movie on here. I think this is the best one, but I could be convinced by a lot of other d- debates here and options as well. Um, this is definitely one where my personal taste pushes it to this one because it's the path of least resistance. Um, you know, I could also, if I were go in Miyazaki, I could also be tempted by Castle in the Sky. I could be tempted by Princess Mononoke. I could be tempted in Studio Ghibli by going with Takahata and doing Tale of the Princess Kaguya. A lot of options, but this is the one I went with. Yeah, I mean, you know, you haven't seen The Disappearance of Suzumi Haruhi yet, so, you know, I, I can't sure. believe you too much. Okay. I'm excited for it. I assume that's when we eventually do our KyoAni season. We will, we will get there. We will definitely get there. <laughs> uh, all right. My number five is The Godfather Part 2. Uh, I rewatched the Godfather trilogy. I, I rewatched the two Godfather movies and that other one <laughs> early, earlier this year when they came out on 4K. And not like it was a surprise to me being like, oh yeah, the Godfather's great. But there's just something about seeing those movies with fresh eyes and going, they really are that great. And I think some part of me had always resisted maybe the, the conventional wisdom that part two is the major achievement. And because there's so many things I love about part one that are not in part two, but part two is the main. Like, it's just there's something about Godfather part two. I think what it unveiled for how to macro structure a complex multi-narrative movie is one of the great achievements in film history. And it was one that, like, went through all these phases because it took them forever to figure out how to edit these two stories of young Vito and present day Michael into one movie. And when they cracked the code, which was to do these like big sort of long scenes and not have a lot of cuts between them, but make them sort of big episodes that comment on one another, every movie that does something like this chases it inevitably to some degree. And none of them have ever done it as well. I think Lord of the Rings Two Towers is a good example of one that very successfully follows in that wake. Um, but it is giant for that reason. Uh, it is also, this is the kind of thing that if this were made today, it would obviously be a 13 hour long Netflix series and it would be interminable. <laughs> and it's a reminder of what you can do with a movie if you're willing to like go to three, three and a half hours and use that space. Uh, a lot of my movies on here are three hours, but this is one I don't think anyone will argue with being one of the greats. No, yeah, I think you're right. Like if, if I were to put, and I would put a Godfather on like a greatest movie list, I think I would also go for two specifically for the um the craftsmanship in that parallel story structure is yeah. like it's kind of mind-boggling when you look at it uh yeah it's epochal so there is a before mm-hmm. godfather 2 and an after godfather yes. 2 when you think about that kind of storytelling and the thing that really clinches it for me more than anything is probably the scene where Vito kills um god I'm forgetting his name the the other mob boss in mm-hmm. the past and it's when they're they're having the italian festival in New York, and he's going across the roofs and everything. That is one of the best scenes in American film history. Yes, yes, 100%. Yeah. My number four is Sancho the Bailiff. I think any list mm-hmm. like this should have Kenji Mizuguchi. 
Kenji Mizuguchi has many, many options. For me, it's always been Sancho the Pilot. This is the first movie I ever fell in love with in film school. And 10, 12 years on, it hits me even harder every time. It is one of the most devastating movies you will ever see, but like effectively, cathartically so. And it's mastery of me. This is, we were shown this in my intro to film for the topic of mise-en-scene. And I still think it is, that is one of the most perfect uses of a film to illustrate a concept I've ever seen because Mizuguchi's mastery of mise-en-scene in this movie particularly is ungodly uh, and then you add on the performances and the storytelling just late period masterwork from one of the undisputed masters holy mm -hmm. crap yeah yeah I agree my number three is The Passion of Joan of Arc by Carl Theodore Dreyer silent film from 1928 uh, famously you know shot all in close up it is a study of faces a recreation of the trial of Joan of Arc. All the dialogue in the movie done via intertitles is just directly from the transcript. So there's nothing invented really, except in, of course, the performances and things like that. Um, but it is just one of the most ruthlessly effective movies ever made. It's one of the best. It's one of the most unique. Uh, and you know, when I said earlier that there's always a chance with like something like Magnificent Ambersons, this is an example. This movie was lost for like 50 years and the like, in like dupe negative or whatever print was found it's a better source than a print so i'm not sure what it was but it was found in the fucking like janitor's closet of a mental hospital in the 80s and that's how we have this movie uh unbelievable that like that that as a feat of restoration this is a movie that was almost lost thank god we have it uh you know gun to my head this has always been one that i've thought of for near the top spot so there you go nice Number two is Tokyo Story by Yasujiro Ozu, which I feel like is a little bit of a basic pick because that is that is the most sight and sound pick of the ten I have on here because mm -hmm. Tokyo Story is usually in the top five, usually in the top three, I believe, for sight and sound lists. And I just can't argue with it. I think my favorite Ozu is Late Spring. That's the one I've done more like lectures on and I've shown and I have a personal attachment to it. But I think there is a reason why Tokyo Story speaks... And it's, and it's not like Tokyo Story like was later discovered as a masterpiece. It was big in Japan when it came out. Ozu knew it was a masterwork. He stepped away from film for several years after making it because like he wanted a break. Like it just was a it was a culmination of his career up to that point. And if you haven't seen it, it's the story of a uh, older mother and father going to visit their adult children and their grandchildren in Tokyo and kind of finding that their family has moved on and doesn't have time for them. And then at the end, the mother dies and they all grieve. And it just, you know, it's obviously all very culturally specific to Japan because of who Ozu is and when this movie is made and all of that. But it is also one of the most universal stories you could ever tell. Uh, and when you get to the end of this one, if you are not a fucking wreck, I don't know, you don't have a soul. It's that kind of movie. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, and it is where if you want to, you know, discover Ozu it's the one to start with and it is for most people and there's a reason and it's just like this is a case where conventional wisdom is right i'm curious if it rises even higher this time on the list um because it is such a consensus pick i would i would love to see it overtake like fucking vertigo or something but we'll see at my number one i thought long and hard about this but it basically came down to during my studies for my comprehensive phd exams i had to read all these books and watch all these movies and one of the movies I watched, I'd seen it before, but I rewatched, was Akira Kurosawa's Ron from 1985. Uh, not his final film, but one of his later period works. And I watched it, and I just had this visceral sense in my bones as I was watching it. Oh, I'm watching the greatest movie ever made. And I couldn't shake it, and I couldn't shake it. And when it came time to make this list, I went, I'm just going to trust that feeling. Because I do think there is something about Ron, about Kurosawa having made movies at that point for 40 plus years. He started in the early 40s, so 1985, at least 40 years. And he's coming to the end of his life. He has survived a suicide attempt. He has been kind of abandoned by the Japanese film industry. This is a movie that was made in part by funding secured by people like George Lucas. Um... And he makes this like lifelong passion project in one of his first big color works. He'd done Kagamusha in color as well. Um, but like done all in his sort of going back to his roots as a painter uh, and making a movie that is ungodly bleak in its vision of humanity, mm -hmm. but so fucking good 
that like it earn it's a movie that earns what you know maybe nihilism it projects I, I i don't know i see a scene like this is a movie that is three hours long and you get to the most famous scene which is the burning of the castle and tatsi nakadai walking out of it an hour into the movie mm-hmm. and then there's two hours to go most movies would not be able to give a scene that good and then keep going for two hours and still be that good ron can do that and so i'm calling it the best movie ever made for the moment i could change my mind but that's what I went with. And I, I kind of like that as a pick, I got to say. Yeah, it's a good pick. I think I would like have a hard time moving away from either Seven Samurai or um, Ikiru for Kurosawa for me. Those are probably my two favorites. Um, but Ron is incredibly good. It's it's like it's like Wells. It's like you can't... You, <laughs> There's you no can't, wrong answer. <laughs> yeah, you, you can't like fiddle too much over picking one of those movies, you know. You could go pretty far down Kurosawa's filmography before you find a movie of his that I would like quibble with being a pick for something yeah. like this, right? Kurosawa is a very good example of why it is productive for that experiment not to do more than one film per director. Yes. Because, because it would chew up so much of the list, <laughs> which just be Kurosawa yeah. movies. And, and it broke my heart to make a list like this and not have Seven Samurai. I just like... There's something, there is something about Ron that just, like, it, it is that great. But, you know, I feel this with Seven Samurai. I feel that, you know, Ikiru is a great example. Um, fucking, if you told me High and Low was uh-huh. your pick for this, I would go, yeah, that that movie is a fucking movie, you know? And that one is Tatsu Nakadai and Toshiro Mifune squaring off. Yeah. So, like, yeah, I say that one. There are several of them. It's like Sanjiro, but, yeah. And Yojimbo. I always forget Nakadai is in Yojimbo, too. Yes. Um because he is the most chameleonic. And uh, reasons why Ron is number one, Tatsuya motherfucking Nakadai yes. in that movie. One of the great makeup performances of all time. That's another thing about Ron I love, is it's all done in this style of no theater, but not with literal masks. It's with the actors and their prosthetics meant to perform like they're in masks. And it's one of the most unique employments of a theatrical device in film, I think, in movie history. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So anyway... That's the 10 I did. Like I said, this was this I worked for about this entire calendar year off and on just playing with this cuz really I made the top 100 which you can go read on my site or on the Substack. Uh and then I whittled it down from that. Um and it was really fun and it was hard in some cases because like again, much as I love Ron, it is hard to make a list like this and not put Seven Samurai on it, but I do think it's ultimately productive to do the one per director. Which also means, you know, I get to have crazy fun things on here too, like Young Frankenstein for Mel Brooks, or, uh, you, know, you know, there's all sorts of choices here. So I had a lot of fun with it. You can go look at it if you want. I'm curious to, to see people looking at it and seeing how many they've seen. There's also a lot of here we've talked about on the podcast. I put on, because it's my fucking list and I can do what I want, Persona 3 the movie number 4, Winter of Rebirth is on here. Okay, I think that probably answers the question I was about to ask you was, what is, like, the one movie on your top 100 that you think is the one that, like, nobody else would ever put on a top 100 most greatest movies ever made list? That's uh, gotta be it. <laughs> that's probably the... Well, but you would do it. <laughs> well, yes, yes. But I'm saying, like, yeah. the, like, film critic, like, circles yes. at large, of whom, like, nobody knows that that movie exists in terms yes. of English-language-speaking film critics. And, and really, it's there for the entire Persona 3 movie project. I did mm-hmm. stick. I stuck very... You would be proud of me, Sean. There is no cheating on this list. There's no Lord That's of the Rings good. trilogy. It's just Fellowship of the Ring is the one there I put on here. Um, but no, I mean, that one's on there. Char's Counterattack is on there. Um, I think in terms of like live action stuff, the one that comes closest to this is the only, this is the only list you're going to find this on is probably a movie called Revenge from Kazakhstan from 1989 uh, that was in Martin Scorsese's film project restored it and i'm in love with that movie obviously it has a following if martin scorsese's project did the restoration of it but i don't see it talked about by other people as much uh so that's probably the closest to a no one else would have that on there but persona is definitely one of them um you know i have takahata's horus prince of the sun um yeah it's it's fun i like doing something like this you're good. And, and we'll see, you know, maybe, hey, when the actual science sound list comes out, we'll all be shocked and see that Persona 3, the movie number four, is the number one greatest movie ever made of all time. And it's just, it turns out all film nerds have been massive Persona fans the whole time, and we just didn't know it. It would be a better world. Um, you know, maybe next time they do this will be 2032. I will 
God willing, have my PhD by then. I they they could invite me next time. It could happen, and I would I would get to. And then in that case, I just put Persona at number one to try to get it on the fucking list. Yes. Right. Yeah. So there you go. I just load my list up with all four Persona movies. Let's see what other anime series can we do. All four of the new Eva movies. All three Heaven's Feel movies. Now we're at eleven. That's too many, but you know something like that. Yeah. Just yeah. Just let it. Up. You got to get a Gundam in there somewhere. You know. Yes. <laughs> Anyway, all right. Uh, thank you for indulging me on that, Sean. I just thought it would be a fun bit. Do you have any stuff before we dive into? I have one piece of news, and then we'll get into God of War. Um, no, no. All my stuff has basically just been playing God of War. So, yeah. Uh, piece of news. This is tragic, mm-hmm. but we need to talk about it. Uh, Kevin Conroy, the long, long, long time voice of Batman in Batman the Animated Series and the various Justice League spinoffs. And the Batman Arkham games, among other appearances as Batman, passed away this week at the age of 66 uh, from intestinal cancer. Um, Immediately, uh, actually proved one of the few, you know, genuine good spots of Twitter is when someone dies and seeing all the remembrances. Because this is a universally beloved performance. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think there are two kinds of people in this world. There are people who would say Kevin Conroy is the best Batman, and there are people who have not heard Kevin Conroy as Batman. Uh, and I yeah. don't think there are other kinds of people. Um, he is, was, will always be the greatest incarnation of that character. One of the clearest links between actor and character you will ever find. Uh, also, just a deeply good person, it seemed, from most accounts. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, also pioneering in being openly gay um, and being open about that in in comics and appearances in recent years. Um, it's a it's tragic to lose him this young yeah yeah it's really sad because he i mean it's that thing where he's both you know he was the best actor to play batman i just think there's no real question about it you know as you said like it's either you recognize that fact or you just haven't watched enough stuff with kevin conroy as batman in it um but it also he was um such an amazing like steward for the character and for the franchise in general you know um he's like one of those actors who plays one of those really iconic characters who it clearly he always took it really seriously and he loved it he loved it he cared about it he really treasured it and he cared about like the fans and everything and it's just you know it's one of those actors that everybody loved him you know so when he passed away on twitter you saw like every like actor that he ever worked with i feel like put out just like the nicest um tributes to him you know all of his co-stars on the animated series on the arkham games um on some of the other like animated movies that he did projects on because he voiced batman and a lot of stuff outside of just the animated series as well for years and years and years and years um and you know clearly everybody really loved him loved working with him um you know so many fans talking about really amazing experiences and meeting him at conventions and stuff and that's like the thing that is most tragic is just knowing how much love he had for Batman and for um, all the people for whom Batman is a really important character because he's so iconic and Batman is really important to a lot of people sometimes for like really personal reasons and it always just felt like he took it so seriously and cared so much about it um, and it's really tragic to to lose him so young yeah um, and again yeah all the tributes just clearly he left an impression on these actors uh, and, you know, made all of them and their work better. Um, you know, it's, we've, we've talked at plenty of length about how much we love Batman, the animated series and how much we love the Arkham games. And, you know, I think Mark Hamill is probably the one you end up talking about a lot because it's the showier part, right? Mm-hmm. Um, the Joker is such a flashy character, but of course, Kevin, there's just, there's such a, steady hand on the wheel when you hear Kevin Conroy as Batman and just like the instant buy-in of that like I don't think we talk about that enough with the Arkham games of the whole idea in the Arkham games of like feeling like you are Batman and there's a ton of stuff mechanically and in the graphics and in the animations that they do to make you feel that but I don't think we talk enough about how just having Kevin Conroy there gets you like 80% of the way there right Mm -hmm. like the combat system in the Arkham games could be significantly shittier and if you still had Kevin Conroy voicing him You'd be like, yeah, no, I feel like I'm Batman because the Batman is talking in this game, you know? Yeah. Uh, and how much he could modulate that from the more kid-friendly parts of the animated series to the really dark stuff in those games all over the map. You know, 
uh, him coming into the character in the 90s, this was part of, you know, the sort of Tim Burton wave of making the character sort of serious again. But I think what's so special about Kevin Conroy's performance is that there's never a point where you would say his performance was like gritty, grim, dark Batman, right? In mm-hmm. fact, I think what made him great is that he could he could put the fear into the voice of Batman where you would believe that his enemies would fear him, right? When he does the I am the vengeance, I am Batman line. It's that good and it sends chills down your spine. But I think even more important is he could sell Batman as a human being who would also, after fighting crime, go home to the Bat family that he's built and put together. And I don't think there's any performance of Batman where you believe that side of the character as much. Yeah, I mean, it's just... You know, it's it's a thing where I reread a bunch of the New 52 Batman comics, um, the Scott Snyder ones with like the Court of Owls and all that after the, the Batman movie came out because I just had like an itch to read some Batman comics. So I read some of those, um, reread them because I read them when they originally came out. And, it, and it's like striking when you, you know, you read any of those Batman comics, particularly the really great ones that have such a great grasp of the character, like in Scott Snyder is a really good writer who really like understands the voice of Batman as a character. And it's like any really good Batman comic and a really good Batman writer that understands the voice of the character, you hear Kevin Connery's voice in your head. Like, and I don't think there's any other, particularly for like a superhero character for whom that is so true as Batman. I think it is also true of Mark Hamill's Joker. Um, but it is particularly true with Batman and it's part of it is the split, right? It's the Bruce Wayne Batman split and the, like the nuanced differences in the voice, um, how much Kevin Conroy makes a very clear distinction, but that distinction is much more subtle than I think a lot of actors often, um, give it, you know, with obviously like the most extreme example being like in the dark Knight and stuff where you have crazy growly voice Batman in normal man, Bruce Wayne, um, you know, Batman, Batman for Kevin Conroy, still sounds like a man like he still sounds like a person and you can you feel behind all the stoicism is just saying like all this like humanity and care and compassion and that it's the compassion he has for people that ultimately is the thing that drives him to be batman that's not just vengeance um and he's able to project all of that while still having the heroic stoicism of batman come through he was able to play the comedy so perfectly particularly when you got into stuff like justice league where he's able to play opposite like superman and some of those other characters that get to play up some of like the more fun aspects of batman's character and how kind of ridiculous batman is as a person while never diminishing the character in any way and then finding that sweet spot of bruce wayne feeling like a bit of a put on and then when that comes away like batman when he's alone in his cave and stuff sinking back into that Batman voice as his like natural speaking voice. It's such an impressive nuanced performance that captures the whole dynamic of the character. And that's why you can read any Batman comic and hear the Kevin Conroy performance, because it's one that reaches so deep into the heart and roots of what Batman is as a character that any interpretation, as long as it's like good, right? As long as it's well done, obviously you can have a shit Batman comic um, and you can almost tell it's a shit Batman comic if you're having a hard time hearing Kevin Conroy <laughs> try to read yeah. the lines. You can kind of tell mm, they're not really capturing the Batman thing here. Um, but any really well written, gripping Batman comic, the Kevin Conroy voice like naturally comes through the dialogue because it is just so much how he played the character. And he could play every version of the character. Yes. So you could have the most like solo Batman basic kind of outing like Mask of the Phantasm, which is a Batman on his own movie just about Batman and a pretty dark Batman story, Mm -hmm. right? And then you can go all the way to big Bat family stories, all the way to World's Finest, him and Superman getting together, all the way to the full Justice League. And Justice League can run the gamut from a very funny team-focused episode to darker stuff as well. And every step of the way, he is Batman and makes the feel... It feels like that character from Mask of the Phantasm is also in Justice League. That's crazy. There's not a lot of characters you can do that with. Certainly not yeah. performances. Yeah. And then, you know, you go all the way to Batman Beyond. And he plays, you know, yes. old crotchety-ass Batman and Batman Beyond. Like, in some ways, maybe his best version of Batman yeah. is old crotchety Bruce Wayne in the Batcave. Um, where, where the old... Bruce Wayne affectation has long since died and he is just Batman, whether he has the fucking costume on or not. Um, Yeah. Like he, you know, he played the whole life of that character. um, And, you know, it it was always a void of confidence in any Batman project. If they got Kevin Conroy in to play the character again, after the original run, 
you know, that was that was like the biggest vote of confidence in the Arkham games, you know, because Arkham Asylum came out back when, you know, the only where you when you still got movie tie in games and shit like that. So people were so skeptical of licensed games back then where that doesn't exist so much anymore, partially because of the legacy that Arkham Asylum has left and proven that. If you're going to bother to do a licensed game, you might as well try to do it right. So now we get stuff like Star Wars Jedi Fallen Order and Spider-Man and stuff like that. But with Arkham Asylum, it was like everyone, and I including myself, was very skeptical of that game before it came out. The combat looked weird because you'd never seen a game with combat quite like that before. Um, but, well, they got Kevin Conroy playing Batman, so I might as well download right. the demo and check it out, which is what I did. And then you play the game, you're like, oh, this is amazing. Like, the combat's great, the gameplay's great, the writing's great, and... Yes, it is Kevin Conroy being Batman. Um, and it was like, but that was the reason I played the game was because they got him doing the voice. I was like, well, I got to check it out at least um, if they got in for it. I always thought, I was always disappointed that the animated Dark Knight Returns movie based on the Frank Miller comic, they overthought themselves. by Like, mm -hmm. I think Peter Weir is fine in that, but like, just why wasn't it Kevin Conroy doing a version of like the Batman Beyond voice? Like, that's who I wanted to hear in that, you know? Um, and there are several Batman stories they've done over the years where I appreciate some of the other casting. I've liked some other people in the role. Um, God, I forget who does it in... It might be Damian Bashir, whoever does it in the like long run of movies that they did in the same continuity in the animated mm -hmm. movies. I liked him. Um, but there's just always on my head, I'm like, yeah, but Kevin Conroy is alive and out there. <laughs> you can always get him, and he's just that good. So, yeah. Yeah, it's really tragic. They, it's, to have him gone. it's tragic. I wanted to read one piece from. Um, there's a great vulture uh, oral history of mm -hmm. the Batman series that you should go uh, find. I'll, maybe I'll put a link in the show notes. But it is, like I said, it's an oral history of the animated series and all the stuff that came out of that. And there's a bunch of good tidbits, but there's this one part where they're talking about the famous scene in Mask of the Phantasm where Bruce is at his parents' grave talking about, I didn't count on being happy, which I think people would generally agree is maybe his best scene in in mm -hmm. all of the Batman stuff. It's amazing. Um, and I just wanted to read from this because it's an amazing little moment in the oral history. Kevin Conroy says, That scene at the grave was probably one of the best. That was the time I realized fully that you can't fake Batman. You can't just make a deep husky sound with your voice. You have to base it in the pain of his childhood each time or it doesn't sound right. When I finished recording it, there was a lot of silence in the studio. And then Andrea Romano, who was the voice director, says, When Kevin recorded that scene, we had to take a two-minute break afterward because I was almost inconsolable. I was crying so hard. I was absolutely devastated in a good way by the, his performance there. I've always said that I will never ask an actor to do something I'm not willing to do myself. So actors trust me to take the ride with them, and Kevin knew that he could open up during that scene, and in doing so, I was right there with him, but I literally could not speak to continue on. I just hit the talk back and said, I need two minutes, and I just lost it. And then Kevin Conroy says, Andrea came into the room and said, that was beautiful what you just did. That was perfect. Are you okay? Because she could see I really, really went emotionally to the place that he goes to. Boy, I was proud of it and I loved it. And I think that's the day I realized this is really going to be an acting experience that I'm going to be really proud of. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, Kevin Conroy came out of like the theater and stuff, yeah. you know, so it's like he was, like, Batman was the first, um, animated like voiceover performance he had ever done it was part of like the thing they did with batman the animated series was try to go outside the normal range of sort of cartoon voice actors that you had in the industry at the time doing stuff like animaniacs and everything um and yeah. then they and kevin connery was basically an unknown in in that world um and then they brought him in and i think that's part of what you get with that performance you know you get as he says there like oh this isn't just i'm doing funny voices for a cartoon or something it is like this is a legitimate acting experience like this is a challenging engaging full-throated performance um and in approaching it from that perspective as an actor is where you get the nuance in the character and that's where you get a scene like that in mass phantasm as affecting as it is he was a juilliard trained actor you yeah. know and and you he was someone who came in with no preconceptions of this character and they sold it to him by literally explaining it in like Shakespearean terms of like, you know, the duality of the character. And there's this almost like Hamlet-esque quality or something. And, and he did it through that and then got to define the character in that way. And that just is kind of the way you have to do it if you're going to be an apocal, you know, defining version of this character, the likes of which I just, you know, we're never going to see again. But thank God there is the body of work out there because what a towering towering performance yeah absolutely so rest in peace kevin conroy uh, missed but absolutely not forgotten 
want to shift gears and talk about God of War Ragnarok? Yeah, what's what's going on in in uh, Midgard, Jonathan? So we'll try to keep this pretty spoiler free. Let's quickly just say, like, I'm about eight hours in. I'm I just got to Alfheim, which is where the elves are. Okay, um, I'm further than you then because I okay. I have finished all the Alfheim stuff. Okay, so yeah, we won't spoil anything major here. Uh, but yeah, I think it's pretty good so far. I, yeah, I think it is very good. Um, yeah, it is, and in fact, I think like. Um, there, the, some of the stuff that happens after Alfheim specifically is where I think, like for me, the game really starts to click okay. fully into place as as oh, this is like what this game is doing that is different than the last game, you know? Because so far, God of War Ragnarok is a very like it's a classic video game sequel kind of dynamic where it is very much iterative, right? It is building off of the foundation of uh, the 2018 game. Um, and so it is not trying to sort of like revolutionize what that game did. It's trying to, it's like going bigger, expanding it. It's got a much more epic sweep. It is clearly much longer. Um, you know, like I'm far, far away from the end, but you I can just tell even if people, you know, it's out there with like reviews and stuff, people talking about how much longer it is, but you can feel the sweep of the game is much more epic. Um, you know, it is not like the middle chapter in a trilogy. This is the end of the Norse arc or whatever set up in the last game so it is you feel how like okay they're like going for it um but it is also building clearly off of like all the gameplay and stuff is an evolution of what um that previous game was uh and it is it slowly introduces you to stuff that like i think starts giving this game ragnarok more and more of an identity i'm just i could talk about like what those things are because that gets into spoilery territory but it is like fun I feel like with the part I met in the game that they keep on giving you like little things of like, okay, this is where it's like forging, like not just this is bigger, but it also has like a different perspective on how to do some of the things that you can do in these God of War games. Interesting. So yeah, I, I am really liking it. It's an excellent game. There's no doubt about that. Uh, I have some like minor reservations, but those reservations are all in the vein of, or mostly in the vein of, I need to like see more of the game and see yes. if this evolves because this this one does have a much slower start than the 2018 mm -hmm. game. Uh, slow again, not necessarily bad. I use the word slow sometimes in praise, and I always have to remind my students that slow does not mean bad. In fact, I think some of the like in the initial part before you travel outside of Midgard, I like that it's so confident that it just kind of lives with the characters for a little bit and lets it kind of linger um but it's a slower start it doesn't have that same sense of focus initially where god of war 2018 is we're going to the mountain to drop off mother's ashes and it's that the whole game sometimes to that game's fault in some places where like uh -huh. it's a little circular how many times you get up that mountain but now you're not, not quite up that mountain we're gonna get up that mountain next time um but it always has that kind of like north star you're pointing to there isn't that kind of north star thing in ragnarok at least through what i've played so far um and, you know, there's also, it is it is such a direct sequel that, you know, I I am kind of waiting a little bit for, like, things to click in of, like, what is what is the thing that makes this God of War Ragnarok instead of just God of War 2018 Part 2, basically? Uh, and I've seen a little bit of it because I don't think this is too much of a spoiler. You do eventually start to get to play as Atreus as well as Kratos. Okay. Yes. And I will say that section snapped in a lot for me of, like, oh... This this is this is different. This is good. It also clarified, I think, a story direction for me, and I'm really starting to like all of that. So yeah, those are like again, when I say reservations, that's not this game sucks. I'm not enjoying it. It's like I'm I'm like this is very good. I'm curious how it grows, and I'm glad to hear that you're a little further and you think that comes into fuller bloom even than what I've seen. Yes, because I think it's a lot of because I think where the game first plays its hand is is the first sequence where you play as Atreus and then it continues to expand, I think like from that point, that concept of, you know, it is it is a trade-off in all things. This is part of what I meant by like it is like a classic video game thing of where or video game sequel thing, where you have the first game is so much more focused like you know we we're just talking about arkham or this is very much like the arkham asylum arkham city split where the first game is very focused it's got like a really narrow kind of efficient structure to it partially because everything else in the game they are making for the first time so it's like everything else needs to be like pared down and then once you have that sort of foundation to build off of for the sequel well you expand it out you make it bigger you add more quests you add more characters you add more abilities you add more enemy types all that kind of stuff um, and that more comes at the cost of the sort of like narrow focus that the first game had. 
Um, but there are things that you gain from that like largesse of it, from that huge sweep and that scope. And I think that starts becoming more clear as you play as Atreus, and then it starts to split more and do more with that dynamic of having, uh, you know, being able to split between these multiple characters. Um, and and then also the combat starts clicking into place more once obviously you okay. get deeper in and you are able to get to like the more advanced moves much faster in this game. Not as fast as I would have liked. I wish this game did like a Devil May Cry thing where it could detect hey, I've got that save from God of War 2018. Just give me like a bunch of the late game combat abilities um, and let me just pick the hardest difficulty from the beginning and just like go at it with that because I wish, you know, I wish you could just do that because it makes the combat much more fun when you can do all the crazy, let me throw the axe and then call it back with this attack and then do the stance change and the spinning and all that shit. I'm at a point where I have all of those, like, or most of those like late game axe attacks and stuff unlocked already. Um, and there's clearly a lot of the game left, whereas in the first game, that was stuff you got, like, and you had maybe, like, five to eight hours left to play it with, with it. Um, so you do get them faster than the last game. I wish that you could fast-track that. That's probably my biggest complaint, because it does mean, especially as someone who just replayed the last game a few months ago, it is, it's very frustrating to go back to normal, like, okay, let me do my four-hit attack, and I can't even do, like, the dodge-forward spin and stuff like that. Um, if you could unlock those things faster, it would be better. Where I'm at in the game, not only do I have, like, most of that stuff all unlocked, I also have, like, bunches of new moves and things that they've added for Ragnarok, and, and so I feel like I'm... The combat has really fully clicked to me for at this point. Um, it would have been nice if that was something you could have done faster if you were more familiar with the, the mechanics. Yeah, I will say that is probably my biggest reservation on a mechanical level, because I'm loving... The exploration and all of that stuff, uh, the the combat I'm running a little hot and cold on, and I think it's exactly what you're talking about, is it just feels like, in some ways, it is much more opened up from the beginning than it was in the first game, because you have both the Blades of Chaos and the Axe, mm -hmm. and I love switching between, and you didn't, there wasn't enough of that in the first one, you know, because the, yeah. and for good reason, the Blades are, the Blades coming back in is such a great moment in 2018, um, but it is necessarily a later game moment. And so I think having both of those is great, but there is just this feeling of, and I haven't even replayed, I did replay some of the 2018 game, but I ran out of time to finish it. And so in terms of the late game stuff, I haven't done that since 2018, but even I'm feeling a little bit of like, I, I, I have other instincts that I can't quite use here. And like, I'm finding some frustrations with it because it is, it's not like it's a new combat system that necessitates starting from the beginning again it's largely and substance you know substantively the same combat system yes. with a lot of the same moves and so that is where i'm like maybe a save transfer or even like you mentioned devil may cry 2 my uh reference for this is going to be much more niche is i always remember there are the uh, gba games dragon ball z the legacy of goku 2 and then its uh -huh. sequel boo's fury and something i love and those are like top down sort of like uh action rpgs and one of the really smart things those games do is you legacy of goku 2 does the whole cell saga and you finish that and then boo's fury does obviously the boo saga but when you start boo's fury there's no save transfer or anything but all the characters are just like at level 70 or something like roughly where you'd be at the end of legacy of goku 2 and they have all the moves and it's just part two of the game i kind of wish this game did that uh, or something like it, because that is where I think like the part in I'm going to be terrible at the names here. Dwarf World, Svartalheim. 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 Um, I love exploring that and everything. The combat got a little like grindy and like there's a lot of it, but I don't have a ton of moves yet, and I kind of got annoyed with it in places. Still, mostly loving the game, but just something where I'm like, I think if it maybe just gave you a little more early on, I would enjoy it more. Yeah, uh, you've got to be the only person who's using Legacy of Goku as a comparison yeah, in, in a God of War discussion. <laughs> Although I played those games also, so I know what you mean. I mean, like, what it, was, it was a smart thing those games did. Yeah, and what Devil May Cry does is it just like allows, uh, unlocks a bunch of the like upgrade currency if it detects like a save and stuff. So you can just buy like the stinger move, which is the like slide forward stab move, which is the most basic attack. You know, nobody ever wants to, if you know how to play Devil May Cry, you don't want to have to re-unlock the, <laughs> oh, let me slide forward. It's like having to unlock a, an uppercut or something, you know, it's just like, let me do the basic stuff. Um, and I wish it, it this game did that. Um, one thing this game does to make another comparison that I don't think anyone else is going to talk about, it does something that kind of reminds me of the Naruto Ultimate Ninja Storm games, 
where a lot of there's like a whole sequence of moves you get in God of War Ragnarok, which are basically moves that in the last game were runic attacks, and they have now been added to your like normal move set. Like you have the sparks on the Blades of Chaos that used to be a runic attack with a cooldown and all that they had to equip. That's now just dodge forward and use attack with the Blades of Chaos. Some of the like, um, let me charge up my weapon. There's a new like, you can charge your weapon with the uh, its element and there's different attacks you get with that. Some of those are moves that used to be runic attacks. Like there's a hold down R1 with the ax and you do the sweep that shoots icicles up. That was a runic attack in the last game. And it reminds me of the Ultimate Ninja Storm games with Naruto, where every time you got a new, older version of the character, they would take things that used to be like a special move. You had to charge the meter up, and it's just those things like a Russin gun or some like basic Naruto attacks just get thrown into the normal move string. You just mash the normal attack button, and you'll just pop out a bunch of crazy shit. And then you add more, even more crazy moves that have to use the meter on top of all that. And it kind of reminds me of that, where there's something satisfying about having this whole suite of moves because there's quite a, a bit more attacks you can do in this game than you could in the last one and a lot of them are taking modified versions of runic attacks from the past game and just sprinkling them into your normal move set which one opens up your range of uh, runic attacks you can equip so that you get obviously new ones or you can use some returning ones from the past game but use them in combination with some of these other abilities and it also makes your character feel more powerful in a very tangible way than Kratos was in the last game. Like he's more advanced because he can use these moves that used to be special. And it's just a normal like combo thing that he can do. Um, and that that is a touch that I really appreciate. Um, because again, where I'm at now with the combat, I am able to do a lot more than I could do in the last game. And I still have, I can't be even halfway through the game at this point. Um, and so I'm doing lots of stuff that is basically as advanced as what I was doing in the Muspelheim fucking trials at the end of my last playthrough of God of War a couple months ago. Um, and I'm doing more, um, they, they've added in a lot of like, um, movement stuff where the arenas are much more expansive and you can swing around on like, yeah, I'm like posts that a lot. with the blades of chaos. And there's these like jumping attacks where you can change levels and you're doing attacks like that way. Um, in, in the last game, all the like combat arenas, as is kind of typical with character action games, are basically just sort of circles. And you enter a room that's like a square or a circle, and enemies spawn in, and you fight them in that area, and there's like no obstacles, there's nothing in the way. It's just kind of a flat plane you fight on, which is fine. Again, most character action games do that. Devil May Cry does that. Um, but I like it this game. They thought, let's, let's add more and put bigger arenas that have more enemies, and you have attacks and like environmental things you can do, like picking up pillars and hitting enemies with pillars, um, and jumping around, swinging on these vines and stuff. Um, and there's a little bit more of like a tactical dimension to the combat as well with your positioning in the world and using some of your abilities that way. And that is also something that as you get deeper in becomes more and more complicated and they create more expansive, more complex arenas to battle in. Awesome. I mean, I'm, I'm definitely looking forward to uh, playing with them more because it is very good. But yeah, and again, everything else is great. I think... You know, the, most of, like, the puzzles in the overworld so far are identical to the puzzles from the first game. I assume there will be more different stuff mm -hmm. as I go along. Okay. Yeah. Um, that was one other, like, again, reservation is probably the right word because it's it's good. I liked it last time, so I like it again. I just was like, is there something fresher? What is really fresh is the fucking environments because even when yes. it's places that you've been before, like Midgard, is the same map. It's the same geometry, all of that stuff. But it is now covered in fucking snow because it's Fimble Winter. And I just, I love, uh, in the PS4 generation, uh, Xbox One generation, I feel like every game that wanted to show off its graphics for like usually an expansion would do a big snow thing. Yes. Like Forza Horizon 3 did it. Horizon Zero Dawn did it. Mm -hmm. There's probably others that I'm forgetting. But everyone did like for their big like let's show off what we can do a snow thing. And I feel like God of War Ragnarok is that but as a full game sequel. And my God, they can do some snow shit in this game. Yeah, yeah, the snow is really good. You know, it deforms really realistically where every yes. character stepping around in it, which is the thing I feel like probably if you're younger playing video games, that doesn't impress you anymore because every video game does it. But it's still one of the coolest it's, things in a video uh, yeah. game. If I'm in the snow or in the sand, I always like look. He's like, oh, look, when I step, it like makes the footprints and they stay there. They don't just disappear <laughs> after like three footprints. Um, you know, yeah, that stuff looks really good. I mean, just in general, um, partially because of the game is so much bigger in its scope. It has way more variety. Like, I've already fought what has got to be like two times the number of enemy types than were in the last game. Yes. I mean, 
it's it's a, a classic again like video game thing where because they were building everything for the first time for God of War 2018 you know the biggest issues with that game broadly were um like a lack of variety in places and you know you go up the mountain too many times because well maybe there was an idea to have a different level here at some point that got cut because we couldn't build the environment art in time or something or there were supposed to be different bosses i think most the thing that everybody kind of knows because it's pretty clear is at the end of the Helheim section, there was supposed to be a much more unique boss, and then they made it another big troll because you fight like 15 big trolls in God of War 2018 because, well, it takes a lot of time to build like an art up a boss and build the animations and the mechanics and stuff. So like they lean on some of those tools they had a few too many times in the last game. And there are lots of really unique enemies, lots of really unique bosses, so many different unique environments. Um, and even, again, like, you know, I'm far from being done with the game and I've already gone to so many different places. Um, you don't, you don't, I have yet to fight a big troll boss. Um, there is a very funny moment in uh, Svartalfheim where you like f land on like the whole big, crazy kind of uncharted -y action sequence happens. Um, and you end up encountering a troll and then Kratos basically just kills him deftly in a cutscene. It just moves on. And I thought that was a very fun kind of if you didn't know that complaint for the first game, you probably wouldn't note it much. But if you remember that, like, I think it's a fun wink at the audience of like, yeah, no, we're not going to make you fight another one of these dudes. Yeah, Kratos has killed enough of these guys. He doesn't need your help. He could just kill him in a cutscene, and we could just move on. Um, <laughs> I thought that was like a good touch to kind of poke fun at the lack of variety the last game had. I love that. I think it's it's a great moment. I generally love Kratos' kill animations in this game are great. Yeah. There's one he does on several of the the big bosses, or they're not bosses, but like little mini bosses that shoot out the little like annoying guys that run around on the floor. Oh yes. Um, uh -huh. Whenever Kratos kills us, he does one stab to the neck, and then he goes to the belly, and basically he's prison shiving it. He's like going yes. stab, 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 and I just love the idea. It seems like he's fucking in line at the fucking cafeteria at the prison, just shiving a monster to death is what it looks like, and it's great. Yeah, this game definitely feels like it's got a little bit of um, bringing back a little bit of like classic God of War. Like it's a little bit more gory. Um, like, again, it's nowhere near those old games were like you were basically playing as a slasher villain, killing all <laughs> the gods of the Greek pantheon. Um, they were, And it was like Kratos really kind of relished the violence in the old God of War games. He's not relishing the violence here. But it is like, you know, there's more enemies that have red blood, you know, and you're like cutting shit in half and slicing them in pieces, cutting heads yes. off. Um, there's more dismemberment and that kind of stuff. It feels appropriate and it's satisfying how it's implemented. And I like because you have the Blades of Chaos from the beginning, there's also more, again, that feels a little bit more like classic God of War. He feels a little bit more agile, swinging on the um, things with the chains. I like that they've sped up a lot of like, Oh, you don't have to climb up this thing. He just shink. He like throws his chain up, and he just sort of grapples onto the onto ledges and stuff. So it, it's a little bit faster, which feels a little bit more like old Kratos. Um, and and that's fun. He you know he uses his like crazy hot blades of chaos to slice through metal and stuff in um in some of those cutscenes, and it just feels like it. In a, in a very natural way, Kratos has taken more of some of that old stuff that he had from the previous games that you didn't see in 2018 because he was hiding who he was and he was hiding the Blades of Chaos and he was disguising all of that. And now he's more comfortable about doing some of that again. Yeah, I'm loving all of that. And just on a technical level, the game is, it, it basically feels like a the, the best, most technically proficient PS4 game ever made uh -huh. with every setting on Ultra, basically. Yes. Uh, if you're playing it on PS5, I should say. Um, and I'm sure, it, I mean, I've seen the Digital Foundry breakdowns. If you have a PS4... And you don't have a PS5 yet? I wouldn't wait. I you, it seems like mm -hmm. you could just play it, and it seems like it's a very competent version of the game because this is foundationally clearly still a PS4 game. But when you play on PS5 with just every setting fucking maxed out, and there is a just rock solid 60 FPS, uh, by God, it is a looker. You know, it does not feel like the most like technically advanced game I've ever played. That still feels like Ratchet and Clank, um, the the new one. But man, this is. You get to Svartalheim and just the detail on those rocks and everything in the caves and the water. Uh, and then, you know, going back to Midgard and having the snow. It is just unbelievable to look at. This game has the best beard tech I have ever seen. Kratos has a big, yes. luscious beard. There's like beard physics. The beard moves <laughs> slightly like in the wind and stuff. 
Um, yeah, it, in a technical level, it is a, a it is a really striking game because it is both that, as you say, it feels like you're playing, you know, God of War on Ultra, basically, if you're doing the PS5 version. Um, you can play it at 60 frames per second, and there's a 120 frames per second mode, I believe, as well. Um, although I think that mode, it was, if I remember the Digital Foundry thing, was like you would you want a VRR thing because it's not. Yeah, it's like nine. It's like a lot of these 120 FPS modes on consoles now. It's like really 90 to 100, which is fine if you have VRR, but if you don't, you would want to stick with 60. Yeah, but I don't have a VRR TV or a fancy 120 FPS TV, so I'm doing 60, which is totally fine. Um, and it's totally rock solid, but it's also just rock solid, like as a tech, like across the board as a, as a piece of software, um, which is a thing that I feel like, you know, obviously post pandemic has been a rarity, even games like Modern Warfare 2, um, it feels a lot more kind of rickety in its tech than, um, you would expect from a Call of Duty. You know, I've had more bugs with that game than I think I've ever had with a Call of Duty game, nothing game breaking, but just like a general like, oh, the menus have become unresponsive for no clear reason. Or this animation yeah. didn't load. A lot of that kind of stuff. And I've noticed nothing with God of War Ragnarok. Um, and it has been a couple of years, I feel like, since I've played a big AAA game that has felt this solid. I mean, the last one was probably Ratchet and Clank. Because um, even something like Horizon um, Forbidden West earlier this year which is a, you know, is a technical masterpiece. It's a very stunning game. In many ways, a more visually stunning game than God of War Ragnarok. That feels more like a PS5 game than this does, even though it obviously has an old-gen version. But that game also was a lot more technically rickety and had more glitches, and it had weird visual artifacting that they needed to patch the game multiple times to fix and stuff like that. Um, and this game... If they never release a patch for this game, as far as I have seen, it would be fine. It's like I, the, yes. I have not encountered anything that was like, oh, this will get fixed in a patch probably. This is a game that feels technically like perfect to me. It is It is the kind of game that I think you plop down your now $70 for and you don't really... It feels like it's worth it. They have polished it. They have made a big fucking game with a lot of care and passion. It being, you know, built on the bones of the first one obviously helps, but it just it is rock solid and yeah. that's great. You know, the the code on the disc will mostly be the code going forward minus some small patches, you know, it's mm -hmm. that kind of thing. Uh, and, you know, knowing how they did the last one, I don't think there's going to be any DLC or anything. This is the game and it just feels, it feels really good so far. There is like a, this is not a thing I would ding the game for. There's just in my heart of hearts, I wish we had the like built from the ground up PS5 version just so I could see like, they still do the thing where you like walk through the Yggdrasil tree to get to places mm -hmm. to fast travel. And it's very slick. It was very slick on PS4. But it is fundamentally, the whole idea is you're hiding a loading screen there, right? Yeah. What I really would love is if this were a native PS5 game and it was just like you select on the door and then you open the door and the world is just there and you walk into it like in Ratchet and Clank. I would love to see that in one of these. Maybe one day. Uh, we don't have that now because this is, again, a PS4 game at its heart. Uh Again, still very slick, not a problem with the game. I just, I thought that while I was playing it because I'm like, ah, uh, but I remember I saw this in Ratchet and Clank and it was so cool. So, yeah, because, but it is that thing where it does load incredibly quickly. And so, like, the thing that keeps you from getting to the other side of that door is usually because they have written dialogue that plays yes. when you're in Seal, And then, it, mysteriously, as soon as the dialogue ends, oh, wow, the door, the door has appeared. Um, yes. yeah, like, like, the, it does load very, very quickly if you're going from you know, cold booting the game and going into your save. Like it, it is, it's not, you know, as fast as maybe like Miles Morales, which was just a, oh, I didn't even, I didn't even register mentally that I pressed the button. Somehow I've already loaded. You, you have a perceivable load time, but it is very, very quick. It's much quicker than the last game was even on, um, playing backwards compatible on a PS5 it loads very right. quickly but again this is like I will say if you are one of the many people who has a PS4 hasn't been able to get a PS5 and is bummed about that uh, dust off your PS4 and play this I would not mm -hmm. like wait and like it, it seems like this game was made as a PS4 game and then scaled up and so you know maybe one day if you get a PS5 you'll want to replay it and play it in all this splendor but you're still going to get like high resolutions and it's it'll be a solid 30 it, all of that it's it's not compromised on the old consoles yeah yeah so just worth saying if you want to play it and then in terms of story I mean, I'm loving it so far. It's, again, it does not have that exact focus of the 2018 game, but what it gains in that is kind of the breadth. And I think the way they have... The most impressive thing to me so far is how they've modulated Kratos, Kratos and Atreus' relationship. 
And one of my favorite things is that there, it, you get such a firm sense that everything in the last game mattered. Mm-hmm. And these are different people this time. There's no like backsliding where we get back into it and like Kratos is being kind of a dick as a dad. He's being a really good dad in this one. Like, he's the voice of reason in the first hours of this game saying, No, son, you don't want to go to war. Trust me, I was the god of war. It didn't turn out great. You shouldn't go down the path of killing gods. Like, he's being a good dad. He and Atreus have, like, a pretty good, respectful relationship. Atreus is really the one who's kind of pushing it because he's a teenager and wants to go out on his own. And I love all of that. It feels like everything in that last game mattered and carries over into this one and there's no cheap backsliding or anything like you might get in a sequel and i just love seeing how those characters evolve from that place yeah it 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 picks it up so smoothly from the last game and as you say just expands on their relationship from there i think particularly atreus um i find the performance very impressive you know because it's an actual you know it's the same kid basically from the last game who has grown up four years in the interim in the real world um and so he's like a legit teen playing a teenager which is a kind of a rarity and i think the character is very well written um as someone who spends a lot of time working with you know 14 15 year old kids he feels very authentic to me um and the performance feels very authentic because it is authentic but it's also you know he's able to i think challenge or or not challenge uh channel like his adolescence through the performance right he's still like very much performing the character Um, In fact, there's a scene where there's kind of like a dream sequence. I think it's past where you are, um, where he where you get some lines of dialogue from the previous game when he was a little kid. And like, even though I just played that game a few months ago, I kind of forgot like, oh, right. No, he was literally like a child child. Like he sounds like he's eight um, because he was whatever, like 10 years old or something. He sounds like a little kid when they're playing some of these scenes in a dream sequence. Um, and and it was like, oh my God, I had forgotten already. Like, as I got so used to how his voice sounds now. Um, and it's just, I can't imagine how hard it's got to be to be that young and trying to do a performance that is this big, you know, like it's a lot of material, particularly in this game where now he's like a full playable character with sequences where he is carrying the full sequence on his own. It's not a back and forth with Christopher Judge as Kratos, um, because because Kratos is not around when you're playing as Atreus for a lot of that stuff. Um, and he's able to fully carry those sequences and the way the character feels so different, right? That's like one of the magic things where it's, it's the first time you're ever seeing Atreus without Kratos around because the last game you're always in through Kratos' POV. And Atreus, as is true of teens in real life, you act very differently when you're around your parents than you do when you're around your buddies or on your own. Um, and how much of that, like the life of the character comes through when he's just with Sindri and he's just shooting the shit and he's just talking and he's being kind of an obnoxious teen who thinks he's very cool and everything. It all feels very real. And that comes down to that writing and really critically that performance. Yeah, I actually, I feel stupid. I had a false memory that they had recast the part because of the age difference. And I'm looking it up and you're absolutely right. It's the exact same person, Sonny Suljic who plays him, Uh, and it makes sense, because the voice does sound completely different because he's gone through puberty, obviously. But yes, there is that continuity there, and he's great. I, I think what really solidified it for me is this first sequence where you play as him, and you get him on his own, and you're like, oh, this is who Atreus, like, thinks he is on his own without his dad, and he's not kind of, like, self-censoring and all of that, and I, I love it. It's, it's a really good performance, and the rare case where you get, you know, an actual kid, you know, young kid in the last one teenager in this one playing the part and you get that authenticity and i really like it um and it's cool and you know again and holding your own next to fucking christopher judge is no small thing Mm -hmm. um and he's done it in two games here and christopher judge as great as ever like what a fucking voice that dude has yeah but then for me the real show stealers are at the very beginning of the game you have a scene with thor and odin and holy shit that like what an amazing (laughs) mic drop of an opener that is you know you get like a couple of hours building up to it um but it's i've i love that they put you meet thor and odin really early because that's so much of the last game and i like had almost forgotten about this until i replayed it so much of the last game is you hearing all of this stuff about these two motherfuckers you know like All of these atrocities that Thor and Odin have committed, you you know, statues of them around like the fucking civilizations that they have laid waste to in Odin's mad bid for power and try to stave off Ragnarok and survive. 
um, and you've just seen all of this, and Mimir's with you, and he's telling you the stories and everything, um, and those characters are built up so much. And then when you see them, I think like they live up to what I really wanted. Um, it feels very authentically in the kind of God of War style, the exact way in which particularly Odin is incredibly shitty. Like he's just an absolute piece of shit in the most engaging way possible. Um, do you remember, what's the name of the actor? Because it's like a really good character it's, actor that plays So him. it's Richard Schiff is Odin yes. and Ryan Hurst is Thor. And they're both great. Yeah, they're yeah. just incredible performances. And that early scene is just like the fight with Thor and everything. It's just, it's exactly what I wanted from those characters. It completely lives up to the build up. Absolutely. I mean, I have not played the original PS2 God of War games. One day I would love to. I just have never found the time. But it definitely feels like, I mean, those are literally games about how you go murder all the gods, right? Mm -hmm. This yes. series is a very, like, all the gods are assholes. And I like that they're, like, very much following through on that here with Thor and Odin. Uh, they are assholes, but they're really interesting assholes, and I really love that first scene, and I like some of the mystery around it. That fight scene is a technical stunner, you know, mm -hmm. it's it's incredible, yeah. Yeah, just like, and I think it captures something about the mythology as well, you know, um, that, that this version of Thor feels like they're pulling more, you know, much more from the mythology than like, you know, the Chris Hemsworth Marvel character, which is a very different thing you know he's an alien in in marvel as we have covered on this podcast before um this is this is the thor that goes around and he gets drunk at a party and accidentally kills a fucking troll with mjolnir because he was like offended because he was drunk you know um <laughs> and odin showing up at the doorstep as the you know the one-eyed man the wanderer with his ravens they just capture i think a lot of the aesthetic um that's inherited through the mythology of these characters while putting very much their own kind of modern day pop God of War spin on it, um, which has always been the God of War thing. It's always had this very kind of like pop quality to it with how they've interpreted a lot of the gods. Um, and, and this is, I think, just a very successful translation of what you would want from both of these very like larger than life mythological figures. Yeah, no, it's it's really good. I'm excited to play more of it. Uh, honestly, my biggest complaint so far is that I do wish they toned down the fucking helper dialogue when you're out <laughs> and exploring and it is Atreus and Mimir just, they talk to you like you have never played a video game before. It's not even the puzzle stuff so much as like when I want to go off the beaten path for a second, they're like, are you aware you're going off the beaten path? You might want to come back this way eventually. I'm like, yeah, I've fucking played a video game before. This is a direct sequel to a game that sold 25 million copies. You don't need to tell me this. That annoys me a little bit. Uh, it's one thing I liked about the Atreus section is there's none of that because he's on his own with uh, Sindri and they just have fun chatter together. But yeah. Yeah, there's definitely a little bit too much of that. It's something where like, because Horizon Forbidden West had this... Had, for Forbidden West, it was just the puzzle stuff of where Aloy kind of talks herself through the puzzles. And there's something where sometimes when it works, there's something very magical about if that dialogue triggers like five seconds after you have just figured out the puzzle and then the character talks about it on screen. And, and there's like... I found that... I'll, I had quite a few moments like that in Forbidden West where there is like a weird like synergy where not even that I did anything in the game to trigger it. It was just a line of dialogue that triggers if you're stuck on this puzzle for two minutes or whatever, she'll say a hint or whatever. But like right when I figure out the puzzle, she says the thing and it feels like, oh, there's like a simpatico thing going on here. This happened a couple of times in God of War Ragnarok, but it does, there is a setting where you can delay it, right? In the accessibility, you can like change the amount of time you you can't stuff. actually the, the people thought that and then the developer said this actually does a different thing it doesn't oh. change the the dialogue triggers are all set and they don't change well they, there should be a setting then to change yes. the dialogue it's like it doesn't really bother me i don't i don't actually like really care that much but um it should be a setting this game does have like as is true of the last couple of years of uh ps5 or uh, sony exclusives it does have a crazy number of accessibility options so like yes if you whether like you're someone who has a disability that needs accessibility or if you're someone that just needs like the font to be really big which even the default font is like mercifully quite large um which that was a big issue with that last game as is with most modern games is the fonts are fucking tiny um, whereas the fonts are nice and big, you can make them gigantic. There's like high contrast modes. There's like audio assists if you, um, are, you know, have a hard time seeing, um, things like that. So it's got a big host of different accessibility options. Um, amongst those should be, Hey, turn, turn down the dialogue dial a little bit. Yeah. 
Um, but it's all, there's a lot of good stuff there in the options. You can still do the thing where you don't have to have like the compass and everything on screen mm-hmm. all the time. You can just make it a swipe on the, on the touchpad, the touchpad, the different zones of it do different things. So yeah. And it makes, man, it makes great use of the haptics on the dual sense. Yes. Just like all the little movements you do as Kratos. It's very immersive. Also, the sound design is outstanding as you would mm-hmm. expect. But I also just want to say my favorite thing about the dual sense might be the improvements to just the head, the audio pass through, um, because you can plug any fucking headset into the dual sense. You can plug a nice pair of headphones or just a cheap pair of like my like old default Apple headphones that I usually mm-hmm. sometimes I plug in fast, and it sounds amazing because it uses their three D audio processing. And like I have found that is not just marketing speak. Any pair of headphones I plug in there sounds fucking amazing. And it really does have that dimensionality. You know, I remember back in the day, I had the special Sony surround. It was like 7.1 surround sound headphones for the PS3. I had those. And they sounded good. And they did do good, like, dimensionality to it. But it was still a little rough where you could kind of hear how they were trying to, like, spatialize the stereo. And... Again, you plug any cheap headset into the PS5 controller and it kicks in the 3D audio processing and it's incredibly smooth and just like going around the world, you really do hear 360 degrees all around you. It's true like object-based sound and it's incredible. And this is, of the PS5 games I've played, this is the best use of it. Yeah, I haven't tried that 3D audio stuff in a while. I should I should plug my headphones in and see that what that's like. Um, yeah, because the it, yeah the audio design is great, just as it was in the last game. The soundtrack is great. It's Bear McCreary back, um, God, you know, expanding so on good. the themes and stuff from the last game as well. Um, but in particular, the the most important sound design thing that the last game did super well that this game does, and now you get to hear a lot more of it, is the fucking Blades of Chaos sound so gnarly every time you <laughs> use them. That fucking the chain sound effect on those, it's just yes. like it feels fucked up when you use them. Like it just doesn't. It feels like it, you shouldn't be using these things. Like they're out of control. <laughs> um, and now you have that thing where you can mash triangle and you can spin them to charge them up or whatever. And it's like God, this thing is fucked up. This is a fucked up thing you've got, Kratos. It's it's wonderful. All right, we will surely talk about this game more in the weeks to come. I'm, I'm I hope I can get through it this next week. I probably can't. I'm going to be traveling for Thanksgiving, and I don't think I'm going to bring my PS5 with me. So I might just have to like take a break from the game for a week, which will bum me out. But I think I just want to play it on my nice 4K TV, so I don't mm-hmm. really want to bring it on the road. But uh, it looks so long that I don't think I'm going to be able to finish it in the next five days. So we'll see. You're probably going to finish it first. Because uh, your family's in Texas with you and you don't have to travel anywhere. But there it's you true. go. And then, and I also have a powerful compulsion where I, I really want to play Son- the new Sonic game, Sonic Frontiers. It actually looks good. I really want to play it. So I bought it today because it was on sale for $39 at Walmart. Yeah. So I've got it coming. I'm going to give it a try. But I am excited for that one as well. So lots of games coming. Uh, God of War Ragnarok, very good. Uh, I'm excited for our top 10 games when we get to that, because this has been an interesting year, and I have actually a lot of stuff that I've liked. So I, I have not played that many games that have come out this year, uh, but I th- I'm pretty sure the last time I looked at it, I think I will have at least 10. And so I'm, like, so I'm excited for that. <laughs> All right. Well, anything else to say before we wrap it up for today, Sean? Yeah, God of War Ragnarok's real good, and I'm very excited to get back to play more of it. <laughs>